There we go. Yay. Yay. Okay. <laughs> yep. Can everyone hear me? There are four people waiting on the phone. No, they're here. Hello? Hello? I think it's only connected to mics. Yeah, one, two. Oh. Hello? <laughs> Hi. This is Science on Tap. Um, we appreciate your patience as we figured out our live stream. We've never done this before, so roll with us, but we're excited that it's finally happening. And hello to everyone coming in from home. <laughs> so we are really excited today to have Ralph Hall, who I'm connected to right now, and it's Stephen McCarty over here. And hopefully we'll get this other mic working for the both of them. Um, if you have questions throughout the event at home, people, you can go ahead and type in the chat, and we have Nicole helping us monitor that. And then for everyone here at Rising Silo, same as normal, very casual event, so ask questions as we go along. Um, Ralph is an associate professor in the School of Public and International Affairs at Virginia Tech and a new economics thinker. And then his collaborator, Stephen Hall, is here, and we are going to be doing some economic games. And, um, sorry, economics. Yes, yeah, Stephen McCarty. Did I say Stephen Hall? <laughs> Stephen McCarty, that's his real name. Um, but yeah, we're excited to get started, so I'm going to move this along because we're a little late. Uh, our next event is going to be in February, and it is called A Virus Walks Into a Bar. So we're excited to be collaborating with Rising Silo on that one. We're going to have a special menu, so come hungry to that event. And in March, we are having a science art themed event to conclude uh, Communicating Science Week at Virginia Tech. So we're going to have some different art displays going around, uh, some live music for you. So watch our Facebook page for updates on that. And with that, I will hand it over. Thank you all. Okay. So thank you everyone for coming along today. So. Stephen and I have been working for how long now? Four months? Yeah, months something like that. Time, what is time? So we met at a communicating science um, event uh, organized by the Center for Communicating Science. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, that's okay. good, thank you. And the idea of our collaboration is to bring together academic scientists and artists and try to communicate um, ideas in new and novel ways. So um, my background is um, sort of civil engineering, morphed into policy, morphed into economics, morphed into all sorts of uh, new economic ideas. And uh, Stephen and I have very similar interests around new economics. So I don't yes. know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I'm a spoken word poet and performance activist. Uh, think about uh, the ways in which to integrate the arts, particularly the performance arts, in spaces where people would otherwise think that they would be useful. And so um, I really liked Ralph's energy, and so decided to sort of smash things together. And this, what you're going to experience and witness today, and be a part of today, is uh, the result of that collaboration. So, yeah. yeah, so we're going to jump right in to just some fun little exercises to kind of think differently about economics. So what I need is about six people to come up here, maybe from different groups. And it's going to be fun, don't worry. Um, we'll also settle for four. Well, exactly. I'll get, maybe I'll get my little daughter. So you want to be one of these six? Okay, you can be You can be the first one. So you got to come along next to Charlotte. And the kids have the courage. Exactly. So stay there. I'll be right back. Okay, so we're gonna do yes, we're gonna do a few sort of fun exercises, and then you, hopefully the logic of this will will become clear. So I'm gonna begin by giving you a bat and a ball. There you go. Do we have anyone else that wants to play along? Okay. Choose your. 
Can you find the rest? There you go. Anyone else? Anyone else? You know, you know, and, okay. So in this first little bit of fun, you can spread out. The, the idea is just a, you got about 45 seconds. Just bounce the ball on the bat as many times as you can. Okay. I've got a little clock here. And just sort of keep track. If you drop it, you start again. I does the, does the rule. Okay. So off we go. Ready? Go. All of it. All of you. Just. Yes. <laughs> The sound and the movement. That's right, nobody's going to accept it. Nobody's going to be fresh. Okay, that's a, I didn't press start on the clock, oh, so that's probably 45 seconds. I got a bit carried away. So now, so keep it, just remember how many you got, by right? Just by sense or number. I'm going to pair you up. So if you guys go together, do you want to go together? And we'll go, I'll go and get a bat. Okay, now this time we got to do it between each other. So you need a bit of space. And the idea is how many hits can you do between each other? Okay. And you just need one ball for this. You ready? I am going to start the stopwatch. You started. Okay, so here we go. You want to use your ball? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I need to go away from the speaker. Okay, last five seconds. Okay. Okay, thank you. So come over this way a little bit. I think I need to stand over here. <laughs> so, where's my piece of paper going? So that, go ahead. Ralph, you're a future Right. So in theory, yeah. Why are, why, are we, why are we using ping pong? What's, what's well, ping pong? so when we started working together, you know, one of the ideas that Stephen put forward was you have to bring some of yourself into the activity, into the room. So a long time ago in my teens, I used to play table tennis and play to my county and then went to university and played for the university and varsity. And then became an academic and got real busy <laughs> and stopped playing until the pandemic came along. And, you know, it's a time where you can take stock um, of what you're really interested in. And I turned the table tennis vibe and, and energy back on. And since then, I've had a lot of, a lot of fun getting back into it. So if you like table tennis and you're good at it, or we just want to play it, let me know. We're always looking for people to play. Mm -hmm. So we we started thinking about how do we connect table tennis to new economics, mm -hmm. right? So here's sort of our initial thinking. So when you're bouncing the ball by yourself, the analogy there is thinking about GDP, right? How many hits can you do by yourself? There are many economic theories which look at sort of the the economic person maximizing their own interest to grow the economy and the idea is the rising tide lifts all boats mm -hmm. and i'll say a few words about what's really going on in the economy in a moment so when you start pairing up with people and trying to hit the balls between one another for those that were doing it and those who are watching what what was happening what kind of <laughs> that was happening, right? <laughs> Laughter. 
right? It's cooperation, collaboration, fun. There's a whole bunch more connected with working together and cooperatively. And so if you're just measuring how many times you can bounce the ball, you're, you're measuring one element of what the economy is. But if you're working together, there's a whole plethora of new things that you may want to think about. And that's kind of the analogy to this new economic community wealth building idea where you have to think much more comprehensively and we'll get into that. Um, so one fun sort of tweak that we thought we would do today is if we go back to the first exercise and try and imprint a bit more of the real economy on the exercise, um, you can start thinking about inequality, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, you grew up in a very uh, unfortunate you know, beginning to life. And Charlotte, I think, unfortunately, you you grew up in a very low-income situation. <laughs> um, and then the other two in this group actually had a very different kind of upbringing. <laughs> and so it looks like, there you go. Well, you, did you already have a, no, you had a big one. Okay, yeah. there we go. So now just have a go again, just for fun. At the individual, how many times you can bounce the ball, bounce the ball on, on the bat, if you, if you have a ball. You got one? And you might notice something different than the first time we did it, right? Look at this. It's hard, right? You got three, good. Two, nice. I can. This actually is a very good visual, right? <laughs> Excellent. Well, hopefully, the message you can see from this visual exercise <laughs> is that it's a lot easier for some to bounce the ball on a bat when you've got a really big bat, and when you've got a little bitty bat like this one. It's very difficult. And so let's give our participants a round of applause for having a bit of fun with us. Thank you. Can just... you tell us a little bit more about the little bats that you were just using? Yeah. Them? So so these little bats are these are training bats, right? So well, <laughs> I brought this little robot that I play with in the garage and you and, it, and you have to hit it with this, yes. right? And that's how you that's how you know you can get the right um, position on the bat. And there's a horrible video of Ralph online playing against uh, a robot, which is like, uh, which the future is now, right? You know, watching, watching this process. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do is sort of frame why we're interested in these new economic ideas. And we'll come back to the, we actually changed to the pizza pills mm -hmm. because we're here with the, the pizza oven and we'll explain what we're going to do with those in, in a moment. But if you look at the economy as we see it today, there are a number of really critical issues and problems that, that we're very concerned about. And that sort of has driven us to collaborate on this topic. How do we communicate some new economic ideas or ideas which are commonly known actually in many different places, but they're just not reaching that critical point, that tipping point where everyone understands that this might be something worth exploring. So if you look back at, in, in terms of things like who owns wealth around the world, back in 1989, about 83% of the global wealth was controlled or owned by 20% of the global population. And this is sort of a classic uh, statistic that came around in, in the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development. If you look at the number today, about 84% of global wealth is owned by about 12% of the global population. So it's actually got a lot worse in terms of ownership, concentration, inequality, right? And it also those individuals have the largest share of environmental impact as well. 
So that's one element. So there's clearly something going on in the economy in terms of concentration of wealth. So the economic ideas that we became very interested in have this sort of ownership element in them. And what I've been doing in my work is thinking about how do you reshape the system from the top down and from the bottom up. And so today, it's the bottom up sort of conversation, like what needs to happen, um, what could happen just here in Blacksburg in the New River Valley area. One of the things that happened during the pandemic was a major um, shift in wealth, about 3.4 trillion, that's $3.4 trillion of wages didn't go to workers. So that money just didn't happen. They stopped working, they didn't have that income. What do you think happened to billionaire wealth? Went up, right? Went up by $3.9 trillion just in 2020 alone. And you start thinking about, well, you know, that's just the pandemic. But, a, you know, a study prior to the pandemic in 2018 found that during the year 2017, the top 1% of the global or top 1%, not top, but 1% of the global population absorbed about 80% of the wealth created during 2017. So this was happening before the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated it. We also have major issues going on in areas such as the polarization of the workforce, right? So what that means is if you think of sort of a dumbbell, right, that you would lift in a gym, you got the thin middle, and then the thicker outer edges where the weights are. That's how people are describing this polarization issue. There's a very limited growth in middle income, middle pay sort of jobs, but you have growth on the tails. You've got high skilled, high income jobs growing, and you've got more growth in low skilled, low income jobs. And in the early sort of 2000 to 2015, about 90% of the net job growth was in the gig economy. So this was, think about TaskRabbit, Uber, Lyft, right? All of those things were happening. So this- so clearly, clearly our economic system. Is yeah, and I get, to, I get lost in the numbers sometimes. Yes. So this is why we're good at collaborating because he comes in and goes, stop. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> two questions aside, um, Ralph is clearly very knowledgeable. Uh, and, it's, and I think what I love working about is trying to make these things make more sense, right? Make these things more graspable. Right. Uh, so that they, they, they can viscerally understand them instead of just up in our head. Right. So we have some examples of that. Yes. A bit more. We're going to learn by map, right? So map. I'm going to grab some maps here. Visuals always help, right? Visualize, you can't have some kind of visual in So we have this uh, very beautiful glossy, decorative still on top of um, images that we're going to put on the tables. For so you long. can spread them out however you like. Yes, we will. I think there's one there, maybe two. And Rob, tell us who helped us print these out. Yes, this was uh, Matt in our in the School of Public and International Affairs. Really, I'm not sure if he's here. He uh, he helped print these out. So big thank you to Matt, our IT expert. Does anyone else want a map back there? And thank you to funding from the Center for Community Okay, I've got more. I've got plenty more maps. You want a map? There you go. And I'll get one. Yes, I'll do it over. Okay. Fine. So, basically, this map is the Preston model. It's really what I would describe it as is the, is the Preston approach, right? So, sort of economic, local economic, community wealth building, economic development. What happened in Preston, just for some context, is around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, a major investment pulled out um, from the city. So they basically had a lost sort of multi-million dollar shopping center development collapse. And this really put a major strain on the city. So what they did was they came together and thought carefully about this model of community wealth building, thinking about the trends that I just talked about. How do you build an economy where workers have an ownership stake in the economy and how do you ensure that the wealth that's um, available locally 
and the purchasing power, so sort of it's available locally, kind of begins to circulate. So if you look at this map, it may be, I'm not sure if you can see the different colors of lines, um, but if you can, for example, that's I think it really begins with the notion of an anchor institution. So this is this is kind of the is it orange orange and yellow lines, right? So an anchor institution, Virginia Tech, right, is an anchor institution. Carillion, Lewis Gale, right? Local government agencies and businesses that are here and are here to stay for a long time. So they created this sort of anchor institution network. And what those anchor institutions did was take a very careful look at their procurement, at their spending locally and, and internationally and nationally. And they found that they had a very small percentage of their procurement being spent in local businesses, maybe 5%, 4 or 5%. And they started thinking carefully about, well, what makes sense to purchase locally? And if it didn't exist, if the enterprise didn't exist, they used the university expertise and NGOs to create these new enterprises. And because they understood that having an ownership stake in the economy is really important because of those concentration of wealth issues I mentioned, they created cooperatives, locally owned, employee owned cooperatives. Or if that wasn't possible, they used, they looked into other ways to ensure that workers had um, a living wage, for example, and people who played in the system, so to speak, had a certification by the Living Wage Foundation that they were doing that. So over time, you know, things started, it was a, a evolutionary sort of evolving process where it began with the, the anchor institutions looking at spending locally. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. We're not talking sort of 100,000. You know, if you think this is happening in Cleveland as well, in Ohio, where you've got the hospitals, you've got the universities. In, the, in Cleveland, what they're doing are things like laundry services, energy procurement, food, and they're creating, this, they're really creating state-of-the-art enterprises, cooperatively owned, they're called the Evergreen Network. Um, and it's really begun to transform the economy and local health in terms of economic, economic health. So if you follow the lines around on these maps, you, know, you begin to see, the, the, one, the complexity, but two, how each actor and each node in this network can play a really important role. So local government can start thinking about what they can do to, to support local enterprises and make them possible. You've got worker cooperatives that are formed, which hire local people and give them an ownership stake. You need potentially to have public banks and public money to invest. There's a whole public bank movement happening around the world. You can follow it here in the US. The North Dakota Public Bank is one example. Um, and during the financial crisis, it did really well mm -hmm. in terms of the investments because it was investing in local small development opportunities, which big banks wouldn't touch. And so uh, it, they proved to be more robust because of that net local network around them. And I think that's all I'll say about the map, but we'll, we'll keep them out there and you can kind of look at them and you can kind of see how all of this could work. And what we're really interested in is starting a serious conversation here about what would the Blacksburg approach look like, right? We're kind of in an area in a, in a company here, which it could be a, a, a node in that network. And so what we'd like to do is kind of start asking questions of the big anchor institutions, like, you know, what would you like to do? What's possible? And so that's kind of the next step. So and what, what I'd really like too is thinking about what, what community-based uh, organizations, businesses that we frequent all the time would fit into this map and, and helping them to understand that they can also be a part of this as well uh, and, and seeing where everybody sort of fits and starting those kinds of conversations. I think what's big about this, this model is it, it, it's all about cooperation and working together. And as we all know, with bureaucracy and hierarchies and things like that, that's not always possible. But I think helping folks see that we're all part of a network 
whether we realize it or not, I think it helped uh, start that conversation happening. And you know, what we're hoping with this kind of talk and other kinds of uh, engaging workshops is to, is to move this from the space of intellectually, yeah, this is this could work, to what does it look like, taste like, smell like, feel like to be embodied in this each and every day? What, would it, what could that look like here in Blacksburg? And so that's why we love, we're glad we're doing it here, Rising Silo, because we see that Rising Silo can also have a place in that as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That's a great later. segue. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Cool. So we, we want to, again, make this sort of embodied, right? We've got We've got our heads engaged, right? And we've got a little bit of a, our watching our wonderful volunteers sort of bounce things around and get into the chaos of it. And we want to uh, get more embodied in this process. So we're going to ask for some other volunteers to come up as well. If we can again get between four and six folks to come on up, we're going to uh, go to the next part of this workshop. It could be the same folks or new folks. Who's feeling uncomfortable? Oh, okay. I think it's shaking the fence. Well, four to six folks would be great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. Can I get two more folks? Yes. All right. I'm going to stop. There you go. One more. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Big, big round of applause for everybody. So we're going to create a nice little crescent shape here. I'll try and stay over here so I'm not going to act like that. Uh, you know, the, the speakers, whatever feels comfortable. Uh, this looks great. So we're going to do something called image of the word, which is a theater game we play in order to sort of uh, think about things from up here and get it down into our body. And so what it looks like is, is that somebody calls out a word, let's say, uh, perfection. I'm stay right So. We'll be feeding our egos as well as, as dining and everything. Uh, thank you for that, Scott. Um, and so we're going to call it a word perfection. And so what we'll do is we'll think about what shape would embody perfection. Maybe it's something like this. Maybe it's something like this. Uh, something that your body can hold as a representation of that word. And so once you have kind of a shape to your body and your mind, what we would do is we would turn away from our lovely audience because they have our, our, our backs towards them, and we'll count down three, two, one, and we'll reveal that sort of shape for everybody. How's that sound? So we want to do this together with the word perfection. Yeah, let's take it. Let's give it a shot. Let's have it feel. And so once you have a shape for your body and your mind, we'll count down three, two, one, and reveal. Nice. Hold it. Hold it. Awesome, let me just shake that out. Just release that. Let it get all funky, goofy. Cool. So, uh, I'd like a word for what our current economic systems look like. Folks could throw out a word for, that would describe our current economic systems. Unfair. Okay. Let's hold that word for a second. Unfair. What was that? Green is good. Oh, I like the whole phrase. I love that. Cool. Let's let's hold on for that. Seconds. So we feel that, feel what it means to be unfair. And we'll count down three, two, one. Wow. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're stepping ahead. I like that. I like that very much. Cool. Um, cool. So, Let's do another word for we we had um greed is good, right? Greed, oh okay. Greed, just the word greed. Okay. Ooh, 
Okay, interesting. Uh, <laughs> let's let's hold let's hold doctors. Agreed is good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn. Let's see what that feels like. Yes, greed is good. Three, two, one. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, cool. Uh, great. So now I also I want us to kind of project into the future. Think about what is possible. Think about where we could be going. Uh, we talked a little bit about you know some other ways in which how our economic systems can be organized. And so I want us to engage our imagination and think about how we might describe those future possible, which are possible right now, economic systems. What what would be a word to describe our future economic systems? Sustainable. Cool. Ooh, sustaining. Okay. Sustaining. I like that. I like getting linguistic here. I really like that. So, sustaining. Cool. Let's turn it out. Think about the word sustaining. Hold that. I feel like to be sustained. It's sustaining. Three, two, one. Ooh. So something that I love about this exercise is you might notice uh, different kinds of uh, gestures kind of go hand in hand. There's a lot of maybe opening up more of a constricted different kinds of shapes. So notice sort of patterns also as we're sort of as we're doing this. What's another word that might describe how our current, uh, our future economic systems look like? Maybe something we were desiring, we're craving, we're wishing for. It's harder to think about the future. Greatness. Is that what I, greatness? Ooh, I love that. Greatness. It's a big word. It's like a big, big thing up, uh, thing to live up to. So let's let's really hold that one. Greatness. Really, really hold that. What would it mean to achieve greatness, to get to greatness? Once we have that in our hearts and bodies. Three, two, one. Cool, 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 cool. So, um, now what we usually do is, uh, now that we have that little exercise in our pockets, what I'm going to invite you all to do is to uh, collaborate. Um, Ralph, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to anything that we just saw, any thoughts that you might have? I turned off my mic. Oh, good. <laughs> good. good I want to get the, the kindest response. Well, you, you know, basically what, what you see is this, the physical embodiment that you mentioned, right? This kind of, the, the existing economy, people tend to have this closed, fearful reaction to it. Whereas when you think about the future, the idea is sort of out on this map and uh, in terms of sustainability are more collective, collaborative. Um, and that tends to give, I'm just thinking of a hug, <laughs> like let's go hug everything, right? And so, you know, that's why I love thinking about these. And, you know, just one small point in terms of what we're doing in the classroom, right, is, when I, what I've learned from 13 years of teaching is that, that students really remember something when there's an emotion connected with what they're learning, right? And it's really hard to bring emotion sometimes into learning. And so by doing this, you're kind of, you're, you're introducing totally new experiences for students when they're engaging with very difficult ideas. And so the, 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 logic is to plant that seed of emotion plus a new idea and concept so you remember the concept because it's linked to an emotion that's the, the that's the method behind what we're doing that's sort of this if there's a theory it's emotion new ideas new concepts and plant that seed and and let everyone else in sort of invent in their minds right so anyway Yes. So what I want to invite our four lovely participants to do this, as you all have already done, is to 
Um, we'll take a couple minutes. You all can kind of huddle up. And, and what I'd like you all to think about is how we go from that first adjective that where our current economic systems are to transform that into what our uh, future economic systems are. So what we're going to do is the same thing. It's three, two, one. We'll start off with one gesture, one tableau, as they're called. And then we'll count down again, three, two, one, and we'll transform into another. How do you all feel about that? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Cool. So uh, I can I can work with you all and sort of make, make that sort of sort of happen. Um, how does how does that sound? That sounds great. Yeah. Cool. cool. In the meantime, how do we engage our, our audience? I will wander around and okay. answer any questions anyone has okay. until you call cool. us back. Cool. 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 So we're take, uh, we're take five minutes. <laughs> and I'll turn my mic off so right. they're private conversation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. on the bar and they are taking great care of us so please remember to tip generously we are here every fourth wednesday and they do a great job for us so let's do a great job for them thanks guys As an the main We're going to take some time at the end as well to answer any questions that we might have. Um, but we're going to have a little performance for you all. So uh, if you'll allow us, we will do the same sort of thing. We're going to do a little uh, story of how we get from where we are currently to where we're hoping to get. Good? Cool. All right. So we'll do three, two, one. <laughs> 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 
What what did we see? What did folks see in that moment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Community preservation. Transformation. Transformation. Yes. I saw I saw initial um, indifference Mm -hmm. and and lack of caring, Mm -hmm. and then a a, a little bit of persistence with that, and then Mm -hmm. finally coming literally a figure to Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yes. The smallest one, bringing up the rest. Yes. 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 Often it's our youth, right, that can see things even more clearly than us older folks that are clouded by taxes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's give another round of applause for a wonderful. So we've seen some of these, we've got a little taste for our pizza peels, right? As an aside, I had no idea that they were called pizza peels. Thanks for, uh, for once again educating me. Um, we're gonna put uh, one of these on each of, of y'all's table. So we're gonna put out a couple of markers as well. You're gonna have some black markers and some white markers. And what I'm gonna invite y'all to do is on the uh, the light, the side that isn't painted black. Um, think about again what, what our what our current economic systems look like. Uh, you know, seeing some of the, the adjectives that have been brought up. Maybe think about some images, can, right? Some shapes, shape. some, some uh, uh, objects that we can draw on there. These could be like little canvases. Put them around in case you feel. So like on the lighter side, Ralph is lovingly putting them up. Uh, black side up. That's great. Some of us have more than one. Yes, there, there we go. go. Cool. Thank you very much. So on this lovely side, this is going to represent our current economic. System. Uh, words, shapes, draw on these collectively and just draw out whatever words or images come to mind for where we turn them off. And then on this side here, we want you all to think about where we're going. What, what are we trying to get to? What kind of images would you like to see in the world? What kind of shapes, words, adjectives, things like that? We'll have white three or four minutes. Um, so, we'll, you know, just take a couple of times and we'll move to all the things that take uh, okay. collectively build these things. So that's, you can come up with one image or multiple, um, but these are kind so, of the same way to draw. Yeah, we, got, we have plenty, so. And we'll reconvene. Okay, so the, this is the.
Okay, right there. Okay, cool. Yes, I just want to give a shout out to the folks online. We'll get to your questions shortly, but we really appreciate you tuning in from, from home and your comfortable warm and cozy place. So thank you for that. Thanks for being a part of it. So, and that's sort of a tone of economics. We'll use our white markers to think about what our future future economic systems can look like. And and you can you can write words, you can draw things, you can express yourself however you like on these on on the boards on the paddles. We'll call them. Or pizza peels is the official. I didn't actually know they were called pizza peels, so I had to find out. And we we actually chose the pizza peels given the connection with the pizza oven, which is why. Right. Hopefully, hopefully they'll spark conversations, right? If you see what what is that pizza bill doing up there with words on it, it starts that conversation here every time we every time we come by, we can be like, "Has anyone seen that pizza peel up there?" So, go ahead and graffiti them and, and just have some fun with it.
Oh, I just, yeah, I just love the the freedom of thinking that's going on on these pizza fields. And it's actually kind of fun just to really have something in your hand that you can turn. And we'll get to that performance art piece mm -hmm. in a moment in terms of, well, what are we going to do with these, what we would call them artifacts, right? Yes. Um, we actually, just for a bit of, bit of context, we did a version of this with about 25 sort of students, colleagues, faculty members of Virginia Tech with table tennis bats. We had what 20 something table yeah. tennis bats and they did it on the bat. So we actually have about 20 table tennis bats with very similar imagery, ideas, concepts on. And we did a performance art piece with it, which we'll do again tonight with these. And you'll be we're looking for some volunteers and yes. I'll let Stephen explain that in a minute. It's kind of fun. It's not, you don't have to do anything bad. You know, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stop then. Uh, we have sort of a couple of um, thoughts that we wanted to share um, in terms of a conversation mm -hmm. Stephen had with the owners. Yes, yeah, so I spoke yeah. with, the, with uh, Jess uh, and uh, Greg with the Bloomers here. And we want we wanted to talk a bit about like well where do they see themselves fitting into this sort of um, this uh, this economic model this community wealth building um, and you know one of the things that uh, that came out of that conversation is the realization that often the values are already there so for example here at Life in Silo they try and uh, provide a living wage to their employee to their employees most of them are employed from the surrounding area uh, many of them are students or recent graduates but they are very they're very specific about making sure that we're you know hiring locally and they're providing again a living wage insurance and they're working on getting retirement benefits as well and i think that that's really important especially for a you know small local brewer um that you know that they're providing that and giving that back to the community uh rising silo you know predominantly creates beverages and alcoholic uh, imbibing as you been enjoying and so they've been uh, especially during the pandemic they've been focusing more on smaller scale events smaller um you know local events as opposed to sort of uh selling to the larger restaurants or larger businesses in the area and they're starting to expand that into these you know larger anchor institutions making sure that what is produced here is going back to those anchor institutions and, and vice versa you know they also operate a farm which is a shared sort of space and you know People make use of them here where you can get your produce. And so they're already thinking about sustainability, thinking about feeding back into our local community. Uh, and we brought this sort of economic model, like often the conversations we have is, hmm, we never thought about that. Or, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. Or, oh, maybe, maybe we're making some assumptions. And I think that's okay. I think getting people to think differently and to sort of step into a space where they're like, I don't know what that means, or what that looks like, means that things are possible. And I'm very much interested in what's possible. So mm -hmm. uh, we're interested in continuing on that conversation with Martin Silo as well as other local uh, businesses and entities to again think about how we can plug these in and we can kind of build and scale those up. So that was very exciting. And we've got some awesome brewers here. Thank you uh, for your customer. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So yeah. At this point, we're going to take some questions. About if yeah, if you ha well, I mean, if you have any questions, I mean, essentially, one of the I think important things to take away about this idea is it's got a, a series of sort of principles which are connected with it, but it's up to us collectively to figure out how do we want to apply these principles, adapt them, adopt them in this region. What's the scale? Like, who do we who do we work with? Um, who wants to work with us, right? So we're, we're really just a, a handful of months into this initial set of conversations. Um, there's a lot of energy in the classroom. Students really 
like these sort of principles and ideas. And you can debate, is it a good idea or not as well? So we take a critical view as well. Um, there's pros and cons. You know, some people will think about if you localize everything too much and then every local entity does that, you now have inefficiencies across the, the country, right? Versus if you do have nationwide sort of economies of scale, then you're going to save a lot of money. And it raises questions, right? It raises really important questions about what's important, what's needed. And if you take one model or one approach, how do you address the sort of downside of it? Versus if you take a more localized approach, what are, what are the downsides of that? Um, so there is no sort of simple answer. I mean, that's that's really clear. There is no one simple answer. But the ideas we're sort of talking about today can coexist alongside the systems we currently have. So that's something to really think about. How do you, And they do coexist where they're working. So in Preston, in Cleveland, and other places around the world, there are sort of pockets of coexistence with the existing economy. They're not it's not something totally different, right? Mm. Uh, but where where the people that are engaged in this economy are employed in it, what's really happened in Princeton is, um, or Preston, sorry, <laughs> Preston, mm. is they've they've seen this magnet effect kind of happening. So as students graduate from the institution, higher education institutions, they want to stay there. They want to stay in the region sort of companies that are working on contracts there and begin to understand, oh, this is how we can anchor what we're doing here and give back to the community. And there's this sort of real interesting snowball effect. And, you know, in terms of skill sets and knowledge, um, it's increased on average in locations where this has been deployed because people are really engaged and thinking beyond just the normal every day. They're really thinking, how can we do this? How can we support others? How can we address the inequality we have in our communities? So with that, I yeah. mean, it, it, questions, well, we're happy to answer any questions you have. And then yeah. I'll let Stephen, you can talk I about it. I wanted to say thank you all for coming out. And yes. And give a round of applause for all of you on Wednesday night to come out and introduce us around any topics that you're talking with. So we'll take any questions that you have. Yeah. Questions about Home ownership for the younger generations and how this sort of happens. Right. So, you know, one of the important things about this general approach is giving people in the community access to not only a income from their labor, from their work, but also income from the success of the enterprise company cooperative that they're working with. And so, there's sort of that additional access to income that they previously didn't have if they were just relying on their labor to pay for everything, their wages and income, right? So you have income from, I mean, the way I think about it is this general approach provides you income from the work you do, your labor, and income from the sort of ownership stake that you have in the in the entity you're working in. So that additional bump in income could open up ownership opportunities to people that previously wouldn't have had the financial ability to do it. So that's one way to think about it. I mentioned at the start, there's top-down, bottom-up approaches. So on the top-down side, I'm really interested in, interested in things such as universal basic income. The question though is how do you pay for that? And one of the ideas I've been exploring is how do you finance the economy in terms of growth of the economy in a way that broadly distributes the ownership of everything you're financing in a way that could finance the basic income? So what's happening right now is only those that can play the game of investment in a serious way. We're not talking sort of the average person. We're talking billionaire wealth. 
you can play in all the investment opportunities, which allows you to just keep making more and more and more money. So there are ways that you can invest in the growth of the economy we want. There's two parts to this. One is just investing in growth opportunities and distributing the ownership of those to individuals in a way that they don't have to pay into it through their wages, right? That's another piece of this. Those people that are super rich and well capitalized generally are not using their own money. They basically get sort of, they can sort of buy into these investment schemes just because they are who they are. And they can get loans from banks without even pulling out their own money from their reserves because mm-hmm. they may be tied up. So they get opportunities to invest. Uh, so there's, I'm going too into the weeds, but essentially, <laughs> as I always do, but essentially you can think about the basic idea of ownership distributed to everybody in the economy that income stream could be thought of as a basic income. What I'm really interested in, if you understand that as a first step, is how do you target that investment in companies that really want to be inherently sustainable? Mm -hmm. So you sort of create this new investment opportunity that's fine out. So the idea called binary economics, it's been around for 60 years or so. Um, Actually, there is sort of really interesting stories behind this new economic idea. I'll give you one little snippet just to sort of tell you how I became interested in this. In in the 1950s, 60s, Lewis Kelso was thinking about these ideas. How do we broadly distribute ownership of capital, right? And the, the people who understood this idea also were working with Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and so one of Uh, the people on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was King's sort of brain trust, um, was was trying to convince him in 68 that the March on Washington should really be a march on Wall Street, Mm -hmm. right? And instead of targeting sort of taxing and redistribution from the rich to the poor, right, why don't you go on Wall Street and demand a new economic approach where into the future we're going to broadly distribute ownership opportunities to people and there's different ways you can do it but then he was assassinated within sort of mm-hmm. six to eight weeks of that conversation and it didn't happen so in the last six years or five years that individual who was trying to convince dr king of this um idea saw that we were working on these ideas or new economic ideas and came back and said you know this one is something we should have done mm-hmm. we we just we got so distracted by everything that was happening that the sort of the fundamental economic idea that could have financed the poor people's campaign in a fundamentally different way. Um, And you think back to the, if you think back to 1970s is when the economy kept going up and worker pay and opportunity broke. If we had changed, I mean, that, all of the forces creating that would have kept that happening. But if we gave people an ownership stake incrementally in the GDP and the growth that's going, we could have had less inequality today. So that's sort of, there's many angles that you can come at this question from the top down structure, creating ways that you can broadly distribute ownership. And then you can do it from the bottom up through this sort of model. Um, and, you know, I was looking at these paddles, right? You've got universal basic income, you know. So I was thinking, that's really cool, you know. Yeah. But, you know, there's the, the I think the thing that's difficult is finding momentum. Because there's multiple ways that you can get there. Right. How do you get the most momentum behind? And it's, it's not an easy task. It's not, you know, I think it's that kind of and another, another question. Yeah, go ahead. All right, it's a long one. Okay, so the question is, can this process work in a community where one or more of the major institutions is not local? For instance, Virginia Tech is a major employer, but we are a state government, not local. Several years back, we were encouraged to shift all prescriptions through mail order by our insurance. Departments were asked to stop business with local-owned travel agents. 
instead start working with the Richmond based travel agent because we needed to work more with a minority owned company. Saving costs and supporting minority owned businesses are both good things, but they pulled money out of our local community as they were being implemented. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of that's a really interesting point because there is there are laws which in Virginia are requiring sort of anchor institutions like Virginia Tech to to make sure that we have a proportion of our procurement going to minority small owned businesses. Right. Um, this idea is sort of not necessarily in conflict with that, but it sort of runs alongside. So it so this is why this is a, that's a great question because it opens up. Or what do we do about this? Mm. And I, I think I don't have a, a brilliant answer off the cuff, but I, what I would do is one, sit down and understand that small business sort of law, like what, what are we required to do? And then start trying to work out, well, what else can we do locally to maybe go back? It sounds like the question is saying we used to do this and then we had to undo it through a law. Mm. So you know, that, I, it's a great question. I mean, th this is why it reveals how complicated this is because you have to yes, navigate. Um, uh, it, my question is always scale. And I think this is a question of scale, right? If you make that shift, does can you just scale up the system, or did, or you know, does the system have to stay local and then it doesn't work? Right? And I think that you know, there oh, there's lots of different again, future economic systems that we can use, I think they all exist on different, different scale. This one that we've sort of focusing on, and Ralph, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is a very kind of locally based one thing, sort of, sort of locally. But that's not to say that there's no growth, right? There's no, it's just that it's stagnant. It's still kind of, uh, there's still opportunities for development and um, in the future thinking. I think that was, that's one thing that's come up that I thought was interesting. It's like, oh, you'll have no, um, you know, uh, you know, innovation that comes out of that. I think that's, that's not true because we don't, we haven't implemented these things. And so I think innovation is always happening. It just sort of looks differently. But that's a really great and important question. Well, the, the scale question is an important one. Are we talking about Blacksburg? Are we talking about here to Roanoke? We, does that include Lynchburg and Virginia? Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. I think it's all of those. Mm -hmm. And then the question is on what scale and, you know, so. You know, if you have an anchor network as well, that network can span across geographic areas. But, you know, the intentionality, I think, is what we're really talking about. Like, instead of just clicking buttons because it's easy to do and the systems are there to make it easy for us to click buttons in terms of where we're procuring from, you know, the, act, the, the system we have right now is very efficient in terms of making it very easy to procure things simply. But... There's barriers. My students have been researching this. There are barriers. It's harder for local companies and enterprises to get certified so they can get into the system. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, Virginia Tech and the local government and industry, they all have different systems, right? Yeah. So part of this could just be how do we help local enterprises mm -hmm. understand what they need to do to be able to support and serve anchor institutions? Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be mindful of folks' time. Uh, I think we can take one more question. Yeah, there was a question. Or feel free to come up for us. And have yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you're yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So the question was, can we test this idea? Where is it being implemented? You know, are there places? So Preston has been doing this for about a decade. And there are some, there's probably maybe five to 10 books, some from the actors who have been trying to do it, sort of political commentary all the way to academic books, which have dissected all the elements of this map model that we've looked at today. It's in, in England. Right, it's in Lancashire, England. No, this is real. This is real. Sorry, I should have said that. This person, <laughs> this is not hypothetical. This is one of the seen. If you look online, if you Google when you go home tonight, this model, you'll see probably pages and pages of webinars with the top sort of academic 
um, activist thinkers from around the world interviewing the local government council member who you can follow on Twitter and you can see what, you know, so this is real. It, Cleveland model, again, decade long effort. Um, we have another handout like this one with the Cleveland model on. So if you want that, we can give it to you as, you know, as a parting gift. Mm -hmm. um, New York, New York is planning to do this. Um, so there was a, a, a webinar where they were talking about this in New York. And so I asked the question, like, well, how did you start? Where did you begin? And it's sort of, you know, it, what's really interesting is that's different. There is no sort of way into this, yeah. right? Preston was a labor government member, sort of you know, elected member that said, I'm going to do this. And just kept asking questions, kept pushing the idea and managed to sort of bring everybody into the conversation. And this is the model they ended up with. Cleveland was the university and the health system saying, we're spending millions of dollars on laundry, on energy, and on food. And they said, why don't we, and we've got some of the, the largest poverty inequality challenges right around our campuses where we're based. So they built cooperatives and uh, encouraged and trained everyone locally to be a part of them. And they're state of the art enterprises. If you look at them online, you'll find that they're using you know, high technology and they're, they're beating out industry now in terms of other contracts because they're so good at what they do. And they were created with support from the, you know, like you can imagine Virginia Tech Extension agents helping create these new opportunities, working with community members. So that's just two models. There's probably 50 that you can find and look at, all in different stages of development. Here in this, we have N NRV Homegrown. Is anyone, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Right. So we have the building blocks here already. But what we don't, what I haven't seen, and you can, so there's, I mean, you probably know more about it. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can buy like a, a homegrown card for $20, which allows you to go to the local businesses that are part of this network and you might get discounts, right? If you show them that card when you purchase. But the idea is to encourage local spending in local businesses. And so we already have that. So the question is, how can anchor institutions pay attention to that network? That could be just one first step, right? So how can we look at the 200, I think it's 200 companies in NRV which are listed. Mm -hmm. And so how can anchor institutions draw from that expertise, the services, the products that they provide? Um, I mean, it's sort of like a matching process to mm -hmm. a certain so extent. I think, again, I think my experience is maybe these things are here, but often you know, there, there's pockets of them. There's, there's one aspect of this is already in place in most most communities. And it, maybe it's smaller, maybe it's district, whatever. They don't, they don't have consortium. But um, I think whatever communities we come from, because many of us come from, you know, maybe are passing through. You know, um, thinking about this and going back to where uh, where you know our home towns are, and 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 just beginning conversations and, and thinking about things. And, and here we we've, we've embodied that as well. It's not just existing in our head. We've also seen what that could look like that when it's Form, when it's uh, when, when it's drawn, when it's uh, you know when, when we're creating in a process as well, and so uh, that's sort of the next step, right? Is we take this, we have handouts, you can take those, have conversations with other people, and just think about what is possible. That's if nothing else. That's what we're, we're we're all about is is giving people opportunities to think about other ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Again, I think we all know intuitively that things aren't working. So what can we do different? Thank you all very much for coming to yeah. our wonderful science uh, chat. Um, yeah, so we have these pizza peels. We're, we want to do a short little performance. If you all want to hang sure. back and help us out with that, we would really enjoy that. Uh, it takes just a minute of your time. Literally um, a minute. Literally just a minute. A minute. Right. We, will, we will time it. Um, and yeah, come have a conversation. With sure. us. Thank you all so much. Thank you. If you are, just, uh, just so you know what this exercise oh, that yeah, we're doing here just just in, to sell it right you've created right future existing 
one of the things we did with the 20 plus table tennis bats with the students was we were like we thought well wouldn't it be interesting just to not say anything more then we're going to have one minute you hold your bat and that one minute represents 10 years into the future when do you do we shift from this to this in that 10 year period Counting down. Counting down year. Every six seconds is a year. So like we would call that one, two, right? As we go for a minute. And that's it. We didn't say anything else. And we we had all the bats just turn and we asked them to close their eyes so they weren't influenced by anyone else in the group. It's really fascinating. Yeah, but you can find a video. It's really online, we got so a So if you'd like to, we got about what, one, two, I don't know how many bats, oh, four, three, four, five. four, five, right? So if you'd like to do that and just you know, be, I'm willing to be filmed on this camera here, just as we do one minute. That'd yeah, be great. We'll It'd be awesome. Year, yeah, right. right. So the peace appeals make sense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yes, yeah, so we're looking for volunteers. But thank you so much for staying and coming. <laughs> thank you to everyone online. We're gonna follow yeah, you over. We're gonna follow you over there. But you can take off your mic if you want. That's okay. <laughs> Who's your sister? Who's your sister, Charlotte? Hello. Who's my daughter? We're still live, right? Yep. <laughs> I mean, there's no one on here, but we'll have it. It's for the right. Let's go this way. terrible. <laughs> Ooh, Peter. Oh, yeah.